Dr. Wright was the editor on the textbook that we're using for our telemetry session. So she's going to start us off this morning. And again, just a huge thank you to Dr. Wright for agreeing to do this with us. Um, after the session, we'll bring up some cases and hopefully Dr. Wright will have time to kind of review a couple with us. I know she has a flight this morning. So again, thank you so much for being with us this morning. You're welcome, Dr. Manriquez. It's good to be here. Um, as she mentioned, I just moved uh, to California. I actually haven't started at UCSF. Um, I start on next Tuesday. Um, I was be prior to that at the University of Hawaii, um, where I started an addiction program for pregnant women. And um, with substance use disorder, I started that in 2007. I've been licensed to provide buprenorphine since 2009. So um, I'm board certified in both OBGYN and addiction medicine. So, um, so we're going to talk on SBIRT, which is kind of the beginnings of what we're doing um, as far as, um, you know, dealing with uh, women with substance use disorder and also um, some of the prevention stuff to uh, prevent substance use disorder and prevent um, substance exposed pregnancies. So SBIRT starts for screening, brief intervention, and referral to treatment. Um, I have no relevant ties and as Dr. Manriquez uh, mentioned, I do receive royalties from the book, but they're not going to help me retire anytime soon. So. Um, the objectives of the talk is just to realize the importance of screening all women of childbearing age for substance use, incorporate validated screening tools into clinic visits, and identify motivational interviewing techniques so that a positive screen doesn't allow, throw the entire office schedule into disarray. Um, I know most of us are scheduled, um, especially with OB, um, to have you know 10 to 15 minute office visits, and we. Um, so if someone comes across with a positive screen, we're, we're sometimes frantic. And that's a reason why a lot of people uh, use not to screen. So why bother? Um, as I visit, uh, as I men just mentioned, no time, too many other things to do in a short clinic visit. You know, we have to talk about all of the genetic screening and all of the um, environmental stuff and cats and chicken pox and all of that stuff. Um, and so um, just, just so much to talk about. The good thing with um, substance use is that, you know, and the good thing about prenatal care is it's longitudinal and there's a lot of visits. And so you have a lot of time to build up a rapport with patients. Um, if you don't know how to ask, you're not gonna ask it. And um, none of us really were taught in medical school, at least I know I wasn't, I think I, they briefly mentioned the cage questions, um, which aren't even validated in pregnancy. Um, a lot of people feel it's not my job. Um, we're just physicians we're, or um, other OB providers. We're not trained as a therapist or counselor, though I have to say that most of um, us as OBGYNs are, are familiar with counseling um, to a great extent. And I, I, I love one, um, thing that's called gynecology, um, because I think a lot of times we are actually really good at um, listening. Um, if we have no one to refer to, that can be a huge barrier. I know that I've gotten phone calls um, with uh, some of my uh, coworkers who said, you know, she admits to drinking, um, you know, a pint of um, hard alcohol a day. She really wants to stop. Who do I refer her to? Um, and things like that. And if you're in a, you know, especially in rural areas, um, there is a sore lack of uh, substance use uh, uh, treatment. Um, a fear that we don't get reimbursed, which I hope um, there are codes to use for that. So um, that shouldn't be too much of a barrier. Um, I hear this, my patients don't have drug problems, and I want to really um, reiterate that this is not true, especially when it comes to things like uh, alcohol, um, where the um, women with higher SE um, backgrounds and um, higher um, education really um, drink more alcohol and are less likely to stop drinking with pregnancy. Um, and then this fear that, you know, this thought that patients won't change anyway. And um, I just want to, I'll put it, bring up some um, evidence that uh, motivational interviewing really does help change behaviors. 
Um, this is one thing I've heard, they all lie to me. Um, and then if that's the case, it's probably, um, you know, if you're being judgmental, um, you know, I had one um, provider that I work with who, you know, said, oh, I really let her have it. She was pregnant living on the beach and she started using again. And I'm like, well, of course, you know, if you're pregnant and living on a on the beach, wouldn't you want to use substances to try and deal with that situation? Um, so really a fear or stigma and judgment um, can really be a big barrier. Um, we had a bad obstetrical outcome recently where a woman um, was, you know, had a methamphetamine use disorder and had, came in for her first prenatal visit at 28 weeks. She had an ejection fraction of 10% from her methamphetamine use. And, um, you know, when my partner in the um, community health center tried to get her into the hospital um, to at least get her to see MFM, to do anything to help her. She said, no, I won't go to the hospital. They're always so mean to me. And um, it was a very bad outcome. She ended up having a cardiac arrest at 32 weeks and both she and the baby died. So this is something that we really need to work on is just, um, you know, leaving our judgment at the door and really uh, getting rid of the st stigma, you know, women with substance use disorders, especially pregnant women, are the most stigmatized people we deal with in medicine. Um, you know, there's a fear of child protective services, uh, which is very real. Um, a lot of states um, do um, treat substance use during pregnancy as uh, child abuse, um, and women um, do lose custody for this. Um, and then the other... Um, on the other end of the spectrum is that they don't consider the use problematic. Um, if they're only, you know, drinking alcohol on the weekends and, or they have heard that a glass of wine uh, a day um, is not harmful, then they, they really wouldn't consider the use problematic and wouldn't feel they need to disclose it to their physician. Um, once some of the things we can do to minimize stigma um, is, you know, go, working towards an addictionary. So, um, and what that means is really using person first language, using um, DSM-5 terminology, um, and then really at, um, going after the media when they use terms like crack baby or opioids, tiniest victims. Um, and just remembering that babies aren't born addicted. They are physically dependent on opioids when they're born. Um, and it is a treatable condition. Um, and, and they don't, um, you know, with the crack baby epidemic in the 80s, um, they've studied these um, children and they don't do any worse um, than uh, comparable children in the same environment. So it mainly the environment, um, the poverty and everything else um, has more to do with that than the substance itself, with the exception of alcohol. So terms not to use, we don't want to call anybody an addict, an abuser, a user, jug or druggy, um, alcoholic or drunk. Sometimes the, the person themselves will identify as that um, and that's their choice. But when we talk about them, we wanna talk about a person with an addiction or a person with an alcohol use disorder, or opioid use disorder. Um, you know, we don't wanna talk about clean or dirty as far as a drug test, it's a positive or negative test, just like with anything else. Um, and then, um, we want to talk about, uh, you know, using more substance use disorder. Um, yes, addiction medicine is still a thing. And there was, it was actually a, a pretty big discussion and it, um, can, when it came to the DSM-5. Um, but you don't want to call people an addict, uh, just like you don't call people a diabetic or we're trying to get away from, you know, saying the diabetic in room five or the preeclamptic in row five. We really want to say, you know, this is the woman with diabetes or the woman with preeclampsia. Um, how this is important, this uh, Kelly and Westerhoff did a study in 2010. They looked at, um, they did case scenarios of patients with legal difficulties from their substance use. They had the exact same scenarios, um, but they labeled half with substance abusers and half used with the substance use disorder. Um, the scenarios with substance abusers were significantly more likely to 
be judged as deserving punishment than the exact same scenarios as having a substance use disorder. And these were professional um, mental health and addiction providers. So um, this is where we really need to uh, focus on the person first. I talked about that. Um, one of the things we don't have when it comes to substance use disorders in pregnancy is all the, um, uh, we don't have a celebrity um, who can come out and talk about it um, like we did with postpartum depression with Marie Osmond, uh, Osmond or Brooke Shields. Um, and so, um, you know, we haven't normalized it as much. Um, it's not quite as common as postpartum depression, but it's certainly a lot more common than many of the things we screen for. Um, you, as you can see here, um, with smoking, drinking, and illicit drugs, um, these are this is old data, but it really hasn't changed a whole lot. Um, you know, smoking uh, prior to pregnancy, um, about a quarter of the women smoked, and during pregnancy, um, this decreased. A, a bit because a lot of women do stop smoking as soon as they know they're pregnant or, um, you know, during the pregnancy. And, you know, most women do stop drinking. Um, obviously, the only, you know, and the most um, worrisome are the binge, um, the women who binge drink as far as um, that goes, the 2.6%. However, um, you know, any amount of drinking during pregnancy is not considered safe. Um, and this is just pointing out some of the things we routinely screen for in pregnancy as far as cystic fibrosis, anemia, gestational diabetes, preeclampsia, and postpartum depression, and their, their um, rates during pregnancy. And you can see um, that substance use is um, actually higher than most of the things we screen for. So what is um, ESPERT? It's a comprehensive, integrated public health approach to delivery of early intervention and treatment services for persons with substance use disorders, as well as those at risk of developing this door, uh, disorders. And this is SAMHSA's uh, definition. Um, and so it is a public health approach, and it is um, aimed at both prevention of developing substance use disorders as well as um, treatment. And that's why you have the screening and then um, brief interventions for those who are at risk and then referral to treatment for those who do have a substance use disorder. ESPERT can be used for any behavioral intervention or as a treatment process for any health behavioral change and that's the motivational interviewing part of the brief intervention. It can be used for your women with diabetes who are non compliant with their diet or their medication um, and it can be used you know for weight loss and any other um, behavioral change. Behavioral change is hard and this is a really good approach. So what is um, the screening is quickly assessing the severity of substance use, identifying the appropriate level of treatment. Um, this can be a patient administered instrument or provider questions. Um, it generally should be something that is validated and there's a few validated screening tools during pregnancy um, that we recommend. A brief intervention is just that. Um, it is brief. And what we're trying to do is increase insight and awareness of substance use and a motivation towards behavioral change. Um, it's based on motivational interviewing. And then referral to treatment is, um, you know, the, the four to five percent of um, people who are identified as a substance use disorder. And I would argue that any woman who continues to use substances during pregnancy after motivational interview, after a brief intervention probably does have a substance use disorder. And, um, you know, because by criteria um, meets that as far as um, having continued use despite consequences. Um, so really providing, um, referral to specialized care. We should be doing SBIRT at annual exams um, and new OB visits, and those with identified problems follow up at subsequent visits. So um, we recommend screening at new OB and then par, um, probably again in the third trimester, um, as we know that, uh, you know, we develop a rapport during the course of prenatal care, and sometimes women don't disclose their use until later on. I did have a woman um, who was using methamphetamines on and off during the pregnancy, was trying to quit, and she had denied it at her first visit, but then um, 
you know, by 28 weeks was ready to disclose it and we were able to get her into treatment. So this is something that, you know, as long as they, you know, it's a buildup of trust um, that happened. This is the risk um, pyramid for assessment of substance use disorder. So the universal screening is using a brief questionnaire or interview or uh, computer assisted assessment. So this is not urine drug, drug testing and I get asked this all the time because urine drug testing is really not a good indicator. Um, all it does is indicate if the woman is used recently. It doesn't indicate if she has a substance use disorder um, or anything about the severity of the use. Um, and there's a lot of false positives um, and false negatives. So, and with the false positives, they can have really severe consequences for child welfare and, actual, and legal implications. You know, women in all but three states have been arrested for using substances during pregnancy. So in case you think it's just isolated to, you know, Tennessee and their, um, Miss um, begotten law that was allowed to sunset. It really has happened everywhere. So you need to be careful and, and inform women about this um, when you're doing the screening. Um, and then, and that more reason not to use the urine drug uh, testing. Um, when you're doing the screening, what you want to do is, you know, kind of stratify them into this um, pyramid. You know, those at high risk are those that like I said, that continue to use during pregnancy, um, you know, the four to five percent. Um, moderate risk are the high use in the past, including recent treatment. They stop late use late in pregnancy or continued low use, level use. And these are the ones that really benefit the most from the brief intervention um, because this, this is where motivational interviewing comes. You know, the majority of women want a healthy um, pregnancy, you know, 99.9% .9 want a healthy baby. Um, and, and so you can help use that as a um, pointing out the discrepancy of that future goal with their current behavior. So the low risk are those are no past or current use and low level of use stop prior to immediately knowing of pregnancy. And so, you know, these are the, the women who have never smoked cigarettes, um, don't drink alcohol, or, you know, um, stop drinking when they knew they were pregnant or knew um, they were trying to get pregnant. And for these, just giving some brief advice that that's wonderful. I'm glad you stopped drinking because we know no amount of alcohol is safe during pregnancy. Um, so what can expect after the screening results, um, only a small proportion will need of a brief intervention. And the goal of the brief intervention is not to cure the patient of the problems. Um, just, you know, and that's what's beautiful about motivational interviewing is you're not responsible for the patient's outcome. The patient is responsible for that outcome. And all of your, all of you are doing as the provider is giving them the information they have, giving them a menu of ways to change. Um, and then if they do, um, you know, during your brief intervention, you know, found to have a um, substance use disorder, that's when you would um, refer them to specialized treatment. This is how the screen, uh, or the expert flow goes in the clinic, you know, screen everybody. If they screen negative, they, you continue with the appointment. Um, if they screen positive, then you do the brief intervention. If the brief intervention at that time, you need um, referral and treatment, that's, that's something to do. Um, if um, they don't feel like they do, or you don't feel like they do, you know, just making sure you follow up at your next prenatal visit. And even if you do refer to treatment, you know, making sure they, you follow up and making sure they're, they're, um, you know, going to treatment. Um, it is a national uh, initiative and, um, you know, the U.S. Um, Preventive Tax Force just came out, um, with a rating on this and recommending that all, uh, adults be screened. Um, again, with caveats that you need to be careful with pregnant women because, um, you, know, pre you know, crazy things happen depending on your state and really knowing your state's laws. Luckily, I've lived in states where um, substance use during pregnancy is not considered um, uh, child abuse during the pregnancy um, and that we don't need to refer during the pregnancy. Um, some states are different, and I don't know about Arizona, but that's something to really know about your laws on that. Some of the other things, um, the American College of Surgeons, the Federation of State Medical 
medical boards and um, ACGME are actually um, recommending this. There's even more evidence. This is an old slide, but there's um, you know way more than 34 randomized control trials and at least six meta-analysis. The most um, evidence is behind alcohol and risk of problem drinkers in um, hospital. It's or um, emergency department screenings. And um, there's some great um, videos on there on examples of brief intervention that are done, you know, in the ER while the ER physician's sewing up a laceration from some sort of alcohol related um, mayhem and really um, uh, going through that and it, they're beautiful. Um, and what we've really seen is the overall outcomes is 10 to 30% reduction in alcohol consumption at 12 months. Um, and um, recently studies have come out and um, shown that it's effective in pregnant women as well. Leads to fewer hospitalization and ED visits and it's very cost effective. So how do we screen? Um, as asking every woman about uh, use using non-judgmental language. I ask all patients about things they can do to affect their health. How much do you exercise? Have you ever smoked? I, I, I ask this more as an open-ended question. How many cigarettes have you smoked in your lifetime? How much alcohol did you drink before you got pregnant? Uh, before you got pregnant? And you know, have you ever used drugs, illicit or otherwise? Um, and you really, don't want to ask it as you don't use drugs, do you? This is a night of four. This is one I um, like, and this is what um, is on our intake form, just because it's um, easy to use um, and it's pretty universal. Um, you know, in the last year, have you smoked tobacco or vaped, had more than three drinks of alcohol in one day or more than seven in a week? So these are the <clears throat> um, guidelines for um, what's considered um, non-problematic uh, alcohol use in women, not during pregnancy, obviously, because any amount during pregnancy is considered problematic. And then use a prescription for something other than prescribed, use an illegal or illicit drug or use marijuana. Um, this is for states where it's legal, like California, um, you know, so, um, and, and also medical cannabis. Uh, this is another really good screening tool um, that I like um, because it talks about parents and it's something that you can, um, you know, get a family history of because one of the biggest risk factors for having a substance use disorder is having a parent with a substance use disorder. So did either of your parents have a problem with alcohol or drugs? Does your partner have a problem with alcohol or drugs? Can, which can also be a really good screening tool for domestic violence. Um, <clears throat> And then in the past, have you ever drunk beer, wine, or liquor? Have you ever used illicit drugs? And then in the month before you're pregnant, how much, how many cigarettes did you smoke? Um, and how much beer, wine, or liquor did you drink? Um, this is the old ACOG form, and I just put this in here that you can, you know, put it in um, to your to your forms um, or into your general history taking um, eat pretty easily. So this is, you know, the cage questions that we were taught, um, you caught her in a cage, now what? Um, so you have a positive screen and you have, you've already 10 minutes into your 15 minute OB. So now what do you do with it? Um, and some of the techniques and motivational interviewing. So Miller first described this in 1990. Um, it's it's been shown to be effective in many scenarios with pregnant women, as I mentioned, um, and actually been shown to increase tobacco abstinence rate in pregnant women from eight to 33%, which is huge, um, you know, because I'm sure we're all aware of counseling women on cigarettes and it's one of the hardest things to actually quit using during pregnancy. Relies on this kind of the stages of change model and um, where uh, people are in that. Um, you know, if it's some, you know, a lot of times we're raising awareness um, and, you know, with the screening questions, someone may be pre-contemplative. Um, they don't think their use is a problem and they're not ready to stop. Um, and what we can do with motivational interviewing, you're not trying to get them from pre-contemplation to action. That's a little too much to really, um, you know, 
be responsible for in a um, five minute brief intervention, but what you can do is you can nudge them along on this. So if they're contemplating, you can get them determined and, and um, prepared. So that's just some of the things that you can, um, can hope to accomplish. What we're trying to accomplish, we know that um, ambivalence is normal. So, um, you know, people want to change, but they don't want to change. Women want to stop um, using substances. They want to stop smoking, but they also don't um, because they enjoy their smoking. Um, so really exploring that ambivalence is really what we're trying to get to the heart of with motivational interviewing. Um, and so working with the ambulance is working with the heart of the problem is one of um, the tr uh, trainers said to me, which I thought was just really, um, you know, telling. This decisional balance, um, really exploring the pros and cons of their current behavior, what's good about using, what's not good about using, stopping, what's good about stopping, what's not good about stopping. This can really help the, the patient by asking these open-ended questions, um, help, help the patient explore um, what their motivation is and how they want to change. Um, some of the principles really expressing empathy, asking open-ended questions, developing a rapport, um, supporting self-efficacy, and that's a belief that change is possible. Rolling with resistance. So if you get a um, patient who, sorry, my dog is bothering me. Um, if you get a patient who doesn't want to change, perhaps, um, you know, uh, exploring that and backing off a little and going for a different tactic. Um, and then just really the, the whole principle is just developing discrepancies between the current behavior and the future goal. And, you know, as I said before, 99.9% .9 of women have the future goal of a healthy pregnancy. The three tasks of a brief intervention are feedback, listening and understanding and um, exploring the options. So flow, your um, task is not to warn. So things that don't work, um, challenging, um, warning, finger wagging, moralizing, giving unwanted advice. And at this point, I, shaming, labeling, confronting, being sarcastic and playing the expert. Um, I'll tell a story when, sorry, just a sec. <laughs> The fluffy one wants up. Um, telling this story uh, about when I was 13 and went to the doctor, um, my pediatrician for a routine visit, and he, you know, did my height and my weight and he plotted it out on the curve and he said, you're eight pounds overweight. You need to stop eating carbs. You know, so what did I do as a 13 year old? You know, the next thing I did, I left that office and I went, went and ate waffles. Um, he was totally, you know, giving me un, um, really unwanted advice, um, challenging warning and, and moralizing, I felt. Um, and if he'd been a little more, and I also never went and saw that pediatrician again. I'm like, mom, I hate that doctor. And, um, and it really didn't help, you know, some of the things that, you know, that did help is just really exploring exercise and things like that that work for me but carbs are my favorite food so still working on that one um as far as feedback your job in the f is only to deliver the feedback and that's the risk of mom and baby from her behavior you always want to ask permission before you talk about this so is it okay if we talk about your alcohol use um what have you heard about the risks of drinking during pregnancy. And we know that drinking during pregnancy can cause birth defects. Um, no amount of drinking is considered safe. And what do you make about that? So letting the patient decide where to go with it, not then saying you're going to have a baby because with a um, fetal alcohol syndrome, because you know she may have drunk in, during her previous pregnancy and her baby's fine. And then you've just um, lost her and you're gonna get a huge amount of resistance from that. Some of the feedback you can give as far as risks of tobacco, we all know this, preterm labor, small for gestational age, uh, um, abruption. Um, you can actually have developmental dis difficulties, sudden infant death, childhood asthma, and childhood, possibly childhood obesity. So some of the um, ways you can roll with resistance. So are you ready to quit smoking. So note that that's a closed-ended question and you're um, more likely to get resistance. So, you know, 
um, a better way to ask that would be how ready are you to quit smoking? Um, so, you know, so when you ask, are you ready to quit smoking, the patient automatically says no. And so clearly you're meeting some resistance. So it sounds like you're really like smoking or not ready to quit at all. And so um, that's where that's something you can say, rolling with it. And then um, they're more likely to say, I wouldn't say I'm not ready to quit at all, but not right, uh, not right now. So when do you think you'll be ready to quit? You know, just kind of let me know. Part of the feedback is finding a hook, uh, asking the client about their concerns, and then providing non-judgmental feedback and information, and watching for signs of discomfort with the status quo or an interest or ability to change. Um, always ask the question, what role, if any, do you think alcohol, smoking, drug use played in your problems, and letting the patient decide. Just asking that question is helpful. So some of the other feedback, this is just some of the risks of methamphetamines during pregnancy. I'm sure we've se you've seen all this preterm labor, abruption, small for gestational age, developmental difficulties, preeclampsia, and maternal cardiac problems. And then the opioids, obviously, preterm labor, and, um, neonatal withdrawal, and a maternal risk of overdose death. So um, rolling with resistance, I'm not going to push you to change anything you don't want to change. I'm not here to convince you that you're an alcoholic. I'd just like to give you some information. I'd really like to hear your thoughts about what you do is up to you. Listening and understanding. Um, these rulers are really key. And I'm sorry, the slide didn't um, turn out well when I change the format. But um, so you just put it on separate rulers. How important how important is it for you to quit smoking on a scale of one to 10? Um, you know, so if they answer seven, that's wonderful. What made it a seven and not a three? So that helps the patient really elicit why they want to quit. Um, how confident are you that you can change your smoking ha um, behavior? Um, you know, patient says a three. Okay, how can we make a three into an eight? Or a three is not too bad. How come it's a three and, and not a one? So things like that, you can really explore their importance, their confidence, and their readiness um, to quit. Um, and, you know, always asking, you know, why did you give it a, such a number? And, you know, what can we do to make it a higher number? The third task is options for change. What now? Um, this is where it's kind of the closing. Uh, what do you think you'll do? What changes are you thinking about making? What do you see as your options? Where do we go from here? What happens next? Um, and this is, you know, some people have actually suggested you have the patient write it down at this point um, and things like that. You can offer a menu of options. You can manage your smoking, cut down, eliminate your smoking, quit. You can wash your hands and change your clothes after smoking, which is reducing harm. You could do utterly nothing. You don't have to change. Um, or you can seek help. And this is, um, I brought, bring this up because I, I was doing a, some motivational interviewing on a um, patient of mine who's, who was smoking. And I brought up the menu of ways she's like, and um, she's, and she mentioned, well, actually, I have a hypnosis appointment tomorrow. And that had not been on my menu, by the way. Um, and because I really want to quit. And I said, that's wonderful. And it really did work for her. She's still a non-smoker to this day. So um, the patient is the one responsible. And she is the one that is um, going to come up with the solution that works for her. Um, I, let's see. Let me see if this works. I don't think this video... I think when I copied it over, I didn't copy the link um, and I have a new computer. So, but this is a great motivational interviewing. Um, it's a whole series of DVDs. They're rather old. They're about 20 years old, but, and from New Mexico, but just really showing feedback in action. This woman um, was, had given up cocaine um, during the pregnancy, but was continuing to drink alcohol. So she was just giving some feedback on the risk of fetal alcohol syndrome. So a rule of thumb when you're giving the feedback is asking a three open-ended questions. What do you like about X? How, what, how does X get you into trouble and what is your goal related to X? So what do you like about smoking? Um, how does, how do you, what do you, what don't you like about smoking? And what is your goal 
related to your smoking cessation. And then you really want to um, follow by a uh, summary. So you like that smoking calms you down, but you don't like that it costs so much and it, you know it's bad for you. You'd like to be able to cut down your smoking and eventually be able to quit. So this is rewording it and putting it in kind of different language. Um, and it allows the the woman to, you know, correct you at this point and say, well, that's not what I, you know, what I really meant. Um, and, you know, you're just reinforcing um, what she has said. Um, this is supporting self-efficacy in the provider um, and just that knowing that brief intervention by itself can affect change. It can motivate patient to get into treatment. Um, so when you um, do find a patient that's ready to get into treatment, just really knowing your local community resources. So um, up until this point, either you've provided screening to uh, require the patient's uh, level of risk from their substance use, um, the providers um, either themselves conducted or necessary arrangements or someone else to con uh, conduct the brief intervention. Sorry, this slide again. Um, and so when you do a, um, a you know, expert in the office, anybody can do administer the screening tools. Generally, when you're doing the assessment, then um, the provider needs to do that. Um, but uh, in or order to bill for it, but you can also have someone else in the, you know, Kaiser ha in Northern California has a great model where they do screening and then they do immediately referrals. Uh, they have embedded um, counselors in the clinic that can do the brief intervention. So the third step is to refer and treat to treatment. Um, so at this point, perhaps you completed a brief intervention, can schedule a follow-up appointment. Um, so if at this, you know, if something happens right now um, and you need to do an immediate referral, and you know, obviously if they um, need something that uh, needs more intensive treatment, such as uh, someone's in acutely intoxicated and um, needs immediate admission, and I've had this happen, um, at, you know, who do we, who do you refer to? Um, or the problem was too severe for the brief intervention, you want further assessment or the patient wants more assistance. This is when you do the referral to treatment. Um, and it's an integral component of expert and necessitates strong collaboration between the expert provider and team and substance abuse treatment providers in your agency. So just really knowing your community resources. Um, again, if you refer and then you follow up. You're assessing the client's referral needs, planning the referral, helping the client access referral services, documenting the referral, and then afterwards, um, just getting feedback and follow-up. So in conclusion, SBIRT is comprehensive, integrated public health approach to the delivery of inter early intervention and treatment services for persons with substance use disorders, as well as those who are at risk for developing disorders. We've, it's been shown to decrease the frequency and severity of drug and alcohol use, reduce risk of trauma, increase percentage of patients who enter, enter specialized tr substance use treatment. And it really is very adaptable. So just some of the resources and some web-based training, which are really good.